Linked in with these conditions is the traditional cold and flu tea. This blend is recognised certainly all over Europe and probably with most herbalists and naturopaths in the United States. It's a well-tried and tested formula. It contains a blend of elderflowers and elderberries. Both have research evidence of antiviral activity in particular. And of these, the elderberries are the best researched, but both would traditionally have been used. They're also supportive of mucous membranes, promote sweating, and generally nourishing and energetically a very lightening effect for this very heavy, mucousy, clogged condition. Peppermint is very refreshing. It helps lower the fever. It has a soothing effect on the digestive tract and makes a very pleasant tea as well, which can balance the yarrow, which has a very bitter taste. And again, that sweating anti-fever effect, which is very helpful with traditional cold tea. It's very important also that you go to bed. The first treatment for a feverish illness is actually to rest and go to bed and take plenty of fluids and a light diet. And this can't be overridden just because we live in the 21st century and there are enormous demands. There's Every century there's been demands. We have a responsibility to stay away from work and avoid spreading affection around schools and offices and factories because that's not very community-minded. If we look after ourselves well during the illness, then we recover well. Spend a minute or two reflecting on why you got sick at this time. Address the stresses and the balances and the nutrition and all the things we talked about earlier. Go to bed, take the fluids, light diet and recover well so that you're not spending 10 days to six weeks post-flu in this post-viral fog of poor functioning. That is much more valuable, whether it's with your parenting or your work or sports or any other aspect of your life. Your body is asked to being looked after. It's registering that there is something wrong with your stress levels or your nutrition or your sleep. And it's a warning sign. It's your body speaking to you. So uh, I urge you to take that into account and look after yourself. This brings us on to lung tea, which is, I have to say, one of my favourite teas. It tastes very nice. It's very supportive of the lungs. It's good for anybody who has ongoing breathing problems or poor functioning with their lungs. Or, in fact, if you're a smoker, this is a, a very supportive and nourishing and pleasant tea to use. So if I wanted to do all that for my lungs, what actions would I look for? You can stop the recording here and start writing down your own actions and begin to think what might be helpful and then see if it matches the ones that I've identified. And you can also think of herbs that you might begin to think of that might be useful for the lungs. So you might want a warming circulatory herb and expectorant herb so that if there's any mucus, infected material or the environment that's mucusy boggy environment that might be receptive to bugs. You might want to take uh, nourishing herbs for the mucous membranes, digestive herb for that reflex soothing action, demulcent herbs to cool and nourish the mucous membranes and have an overall cooling effect, anti-inflammatory effect, and an antimicrobial. To achieve all those actions, there's many herbs I could have chosen, but these are the ones I settled on. Ginger, which is a warming, digestive, antimicrobial and anti-inflammatory and also has a sweating promotion effect. Elderflower is restorative to the mucous membranes in a nourishing way. It is a muscle nervine, so it relaxes all the muscles, particularly around the chest and the neck, is the action we're particularly looking for. It has an antiviral effect. And you also have licorice. Licorice is an expectorant herb. Also supportive for the adrenal gland function, which makes it an adaptogen. And very nice taste as well, a sweet taste, which makes it very pleasant. Thyme is all of the things we've covered before. It's antimicrobial and expectorant in particular. And marshmallow leaf is soothing, cooling and demulcent and digestive. So all of those together make a very pleasant tasting tea. I'll just draw your attention to the fact that in a small percentage of people, possibly 3 to 5%, with licorice, they have an effect of increasing the blood pressure. And this is because of the effect on the adrenal gland, on aldosterone, 
A-L-D-O-S-T-E-R-O-N-E. Don't worry about it. Aldosterone is one of the messengers produced by the adrenal gland. Um, And a small percentage of people are particularly sensitive to one of the constituents of licorice. Now, people can test this for themselves. They can drink the lung tea for a week, check their blood pressure before they start, and recheck their blood pressure in a week's time and in a month's time. And if it has no effect on the blood pressure, then they're not one of those 5%. So people can actually check this for themselves. Most chemists or pharmacies and some health food shops have blood pressure monitors or they can go along to their healthcare provider and have a blood pressure check, which is a good idea once a year anyway, if you're over 35 in particular. So it's something to be watched out for. Again, if people uh, have high blood pressure and they're on treatment for it, it's probably not the best choice. So just to be aware of that. These are the actions that I would consider if I'm looking to help somebody who has chronic catarrh. Now, mucous membrane is another excretory organ, and mucus has a function as an excretory eliminative substance. It is also highly protective, particularly of the stomach, and also around the areas where there is a border between the inside of the body and the outside of the body. So the orifices, such as the mouth, the back passage, the front passage, uh, the vagina, in the eyes. So where the external skin meets the internal skin, all of these areas have particular requirements to fight off infections, to act as a barrier. And mucus plays an important protective role in all of these areas. So it's a bit of a different way of looking at the body. So excretion and elimination and protection And also it has a more direct effect on nourishment, particularly in the digestive tract, in terms of prebiotics and probiotics. So it's very dynamic. The lining cells of the mucous membranes are changed every three days. It's the fastest turnover of all the tissues in the body. The slowest turnover is your bones, which is every seven years. So you are a dynamic process. You're a completely new person every seven years, which is an interesting concept. We're not static. Our genes are pliable. So all of this is very optimistic and hopeful in terms of treating acute conditions, chronic conditions, changing our internal environment by changing our behavior and what we're exposed to and our internal emotional and um, I'm thinking of mindfulness, how important that is. Anyway, that's all diversification. So let's get back to Qatar. With Qatar, you're thinking about why the body might want to keep producing mucus. It might want to eliminate something. It might be in need of more nourishment and it might be soothing. What we want to do is promote the alterative actions of the herbs, which are helping the body eliminate so that the body isn't relying on your mucous membranes to act as an excretory organ. A decongestant, which is um, an anti-boggy effect, a bit like astringency, where you're actually squeezing the tissues and you might improve the circulatory function, you might have an astringent action, a nourishing action, and all of these will act to decongest. A nervine, because one of the things that affects all of the stress reactions is interpreted by the body in terms of the hormone system, the allergy system, and all of these have an active effect on the mucous membranes and digestive. What happens in the digestive tract, which is a whole tube of mucous membrane producing tissue, has a very important effect and reflects the condition of the mucous membranes, for instance, in the vagina and in the nasal passages. I know that might sound a bit strange when you're thinking of physiology in this way. It certainly was to me when I first started thinking like this, as opposed to fitting the anatomy and physiology into little boxes. When you think about the overall functions of tissues, you make a lot more linkages between the different orthodox medicine systems than you otherwise might have. Uh, It took me a long time, or quite a while, to get used to this way of thinking about things. So you're thinking about tissue health, and you're thinking about mucous membrane tissue health in particular. So now we go on to the herbs that I have suggested using to improve catarrh. So here's a new herb that you might not have thought of before, and it's bayberry. 
This is a lovely, lovely herb. It acts as a circulatory stimulant, an astringent action. It particularly has a decongestant effect, particular to mucous membranes, and it has an antimicrobial effect. So there you go, you have it in one. But of course, there's always additional actions that can be helpful. For that, I use skullcap, which is antispasmodic and a relaxing nervine. Elderflower, because it's nourishing for the mucous membranes, antiviral, and it has this promoting sweating. So you can begin to fill in from your previous knowledge the effects for the different herbs. So you're looking at that blend now and thinking, oh yeah, I can see why she would put elderflower in there or why it might be nice. Eyebright is a herb that's mucous membrane supportive, particularly noticeable in a traditional sense for the effect on the conjunctiva, which is the lining between the eyeball and the eyelid. Very important mucous membrane protective function. Eyebright was always traditionally noticed to be useful for improving conditions of the eyes, but in fact it has those effects on all the mucous membranes in the body. It's anti-allergy and mucous membrane supporting and slightly astringent. So all of these actions together would make for a very nice decongestive blend. You can also see how that would combine very nicely with a sinus tea, so that people could use the decongestion blend for four to six weeks at the same time as the sinus tea, and then continue with the sinus tea. And if they get flare-ups, then they can use the decongestion blend to add additional actions. I've included this slide just to show you the integration of the body. This happens to show the venous flow and all of the metabolites from the body have to be returned to the central circulation, which would include the venous system. This drains the small blood vessels from the tissues and brings all of the constituents back to the heart also to the liver for metabolizing any of the substances that need to be eliminated and complex elimination. All of the ones below the heart have an anti-gravity circulation, which is enhanced by valves and also by muscle pumps. So it's another reason for exercising and using your muscles. You could say that the muscles in the calves and the thighs are like hearts pumping back the venous circulation back to the general circulation. This also applies to lymph flow, which is undervalued in modern medicine, in my opinion. Exercise is very important for return and for circulating all the fluids around the tissues. So it's just another reminder as to how important exercise is.